Is there any homework? Yep. Yes. Number 28? 28? 22. 15, 8, 22? 22, you said? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see. So they give you this integral. 22, it says, oh boy. Y squared D, uh, what's your D squared? It's got a lie above the cone. And below the sphere, So the, the, I'm sure the question would probably have to be, well, what's your question? I mean, that. Uh, uh, the question for coordinates. Well, what's your question? Like how to set up the integral? Yeah, because you're having trouble finding what? The integration. Well, so it's got to be above this cone and below the sphere. So obviously, you need to find out where the intersect. The intersect. Right? Okay. So what have you tried so far? I mean, that's... I tried rho from 0 to 1, and then phi from 0 to phi over 3, and theta from 0 to 2 pi. I tried, and tried to plug in stuff for y and z, but I didn't work out. So uh, your problem is you've got to stay inside this. So you do have to find something out about these, right? I mean, this is, uh, so they give you, the sphere's row is one. So you've got, if you do like, uh, oh, wow, that's good. So you got the sphere, you can kind of envision this, and you got this cone, the cone, phi, equal phi over three, that's a cone because then theta could be whatever it wants to be. So you get this kind of thing going on, right? So of course that cone goes out to the sphere, and then it goes around. So it's got to be below the sphere and above the cone. So you got like basically the ice cream is what you're trying to find. You with me? We're trying to evaluate across that region, the ice cream. So you got a cone, you got the sphere, all right? So you're trying to go across this region. So this would be phi equals pi over three, and this would be rho equals one. Of course, it's not drawn to scale. So I, I totally agree with you that you're going to be going from 0 to pi over 3. That seems to make sense. And then theta is going to be going from... Yeah, but what's rho going to be going from to? And actually, it lies... So it lies... Uh, how do I say it? Above the cone and below the sphere. So it's really the ice cream in the cone. Right? So, for example, you're going to be going from here to here, from here to there, from there to there. So, what's the trouble then? I don't understand. What do you have? How do you change y squared and z squared to square Ah, okay. There you. Go. That's the question. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So, what do you? What do you know? What? What? Um, what conversions do you know? So, for spherical, what do we know is true? And then dv, of course, is what. Rho squared sine phi, yeah. All right, so your trouble then is the interior, right? All right, so you replace y with what it is, you replace z with what it is, and then you got rho squared sine phi. D rho d, d, d theta, right? Okay, uh, and 
So you, this is probably, what do you think is gonna sound? This it sounds like it's getting closer to like, it's got a lot of trig in it. So possibly it's one of those weird sine cosine deals. You gotta be really careful about how you, you do phi versus theta for yourself. Oh, that would so suck to get those mixed up. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. It's gonna be, you hope for U sub, maybe it's gonna be some kind of weird trig thing where you have to use identities to help you out with it. So that's what it sounds like it's heading towards for me. I'll try again, but I think I used the wrong identity. Okay, okay. To me, that's that's the kind of problem that's that's kind of, uh, how do I say it? It's easy to fix, you just have to go back and remember some of the methods there are for doing the interval. Okay, that's not the, so that's a good question. There's another question in that section I thought that I have gotten some questions about. Is it about uh, find the average? Yeah, so number 28, have you guys done number 28 yet? Can I ask you, so in this 28, am I supposed to assume that it's like a center of mass kind of thing? Well, I mean, you could sort of relate it to that idea, but you don't have to think about it like that at all, right? Because I was thinking about it this way, and that's how I was like... Okay, sure, it. yeah, because you, you assume what kind of density. Okay, yeah. well, okay, you yeah. could do it that way, sure. But how do you find the average anything? How do you find the average age in this room? Yeah. Add up all the ages, and of course you're in calculus, so what's addition? Because we're talking about uh, uh, the distance would be a continuous function from zero to the boundary, and in fact, in all these different directions. So it's like an infinite infinity of, of distances. So we're going to have to freaking use integrals, right? So add up the whatevers, the ages in this case, add up the distances, and then divide by how many there are, right? So in, in math 180, to find the average height of some function between A and B, you integrate the function, and then you divide by B minus A. So this, this idea of the length being a representation of how many there are continues, and now we're in a higher dimension. So we're not going to divide by a length. We're not going to divide by an area. We're going to divide by the, the sphere's volume. I like it. So it's just an extension of this idea from Math 180 into three dimensions. So that problem is a one-liner in those. Now you know that those are very often the more evil ones. But this one is, is not as evil as it sounds. What's the distance from... In fact, where's the center going to be? Does it matter? I love you guys. So you're talking about distance? Does it matter where I put the center... <coughs> Here's the center. Oh, what if I put it over here? Oh, the distance is going to give a shit. So where am I going to put the center? This is, thank God. Yeah, it's going, to, it's going to make things a little bit better. They didn't say anything about it. So this question is telling me it doesn't matter. Right? They didn't say a word about where the center is or anything. So it doesn't matter. It can't matter. The ball is just sitting there. So I can put the center at 0, 0, 0, 11. So how far away from the center is a point in the ball? X, Y, Z. Sure, X, Y, Z if you want to use. You're not going to use rectangular coordinates, are you? For a couple reasons. Number one, it's the sphere. Number two, you're in the spherical coordinates section. Row, yeah, row. I love it. So if I integrate, if I triple integrate, if I just do this, what am I going to end up with? Yeah. Yeah, because what are you actually putting in? What's the function that I put in? No, no, what's the function that I put in right now, so far? What function have I put in? What, what is this? What is this? DV. So what function is in there? One. So that, of course, if you do this work, you're going to get four-thirds pi r cubed. Because this would be the volume of a sphere. So dear God, don't do that to yourself. You already know that. So what's the volume of the sphere? Four-thirds pi r a cubed, oh, there you go, the radius is there. I love it. <laughs> right? So you're going to divide by that. So what am I going to put in here then? The thing you told me earlier is the function that I actually want to work with, that I want to add. Row. 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 
You see, it's so easy to, to see this and think something's already in there. No, I haven't put a damn thing in there yet. This is all just DV. I haven't put anything into it yet. So you got to really use the DA, the different DAs there are, the, this DV you got to use to it. So you know if there's something in there yet. There's nothing in there. So it's going to be like a one that's going to be a volume. I don't want that. I want the distances. I want to add up all the distances. Okay, I like it. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. The intersection is pretty straightforward. I mean, well, the function itself is straightforward, but the A's. All the A's do. So 42 gives you this triple integral, and it asks you to sketch a graph of it. Now, the, the worst of a drawer you are, if I had me in this class, I would say to me, Give me an explanation next to every one of your drawings. Oh my God, right? Because you, 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 you see me. So yeah, that's all you can do. You, you try to draw a sucker, but you put next to it the explanation of what's going on. Use your 3D graph paper, right? Um, or don't, as long as you can make it clear. So they give you this. <laughs> they give you I just didn't give myself enough time to go get some new markers. Negative A to A, negative square root, yeah, A squared minus U. Is that Y? Y squared, yeah. Integral, square root, A squared minus X squared minus Y squared. Negative. Uh, and then inside crap, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the inside crap and the, and the D, X, D, Y, Z, you can change that. The Z, D, X, D, Y in this case. But uh, the important thing is this is you can't translate. Uh, like if you try to translate from uh, Arabic to English word by word, won't it sound really funny? You go to Google Translate, it's a weird ass. House white down, road go me. Yeah, no. So you can't translate. We've already talked about this a couple times. You can't just translate each piece of this somehow magically. You have to get an idea of what it is talking about. Right. The same thing you have to do if you're trying to translate a sentence. What are they talking about? And then describe that situation in the new language. So what the hell does all this shit look like? What are these? This is what Z is doing, right? Or this is what, in this case, yeah, Z. Yeah, it's the most interesting. That's what Z is doing. So what does this region look like here? Sphere. Spheres. From the bottom of the sphere to the top of the sphere. Now, this problem, once you start to break it down, you should almost not even have to graph anything. But if you graph anything, it would be these two. And what do I keep saying those two are? So this is DZ, DX, DY. What is this? What, what's special about that plane? That plane is the what plane. That's where I'm getting my inputs. It's the input plane. So yeah, you can graph this bad boy, but can, can you guys see what's, what's this going from to? Top of the yeah, bottom of a circle to the top of a circle. Of radius A. And the sphere is radius A. right? So it's x, y trace would be radius A, because it's at the center. And then this, of course, is the freaking A. Right, so in, in x, y coordinate, what is this looking for? Uh, y is going from negative a to a, while x is going from the bottom to the top. Right? That's what that's saying. You guys see that? So yeah, I would definitely graph this if I need to. Don't try to graph the 3D unless you're good at it. because it, it's, Very often it's not even that necessary to do, but sometimes it is. Like that one problem we did before, I wanted to get it right so you could really see what's going, what surfaces you're talking about. Here, I know what the hell that is. So, so what is this region then? Is it part of something? What about the sphere? It's the. It's the. Is it is it the top half of the sphere? It's entire. It's the entire sphere. I like it. Well, it's the entire sphere. So, what's phi go from to? Phi goes from. Zero to pi. Zero to pi. I love it. 
Why would you never go past pi? Because what takes care of that? Theta. theta gets me around there if I need to be over there. I like it. And theta here is going to be? Zero to two pi. And rho is going to be? Zero to eight. I like it. And then you just got to, like you said, uh, whoever asks the question, you just have to change the inside according to uh, the, the conversion formulas. Yeah? What if you get this, like, out of all of this, you get zero? <laughs> it's not impossible. That would just mean that whatever this function is, across that region, it cancels itself out, right? Which is completely possible. So it's sort of like a conductor. <laughs> And the electric field inside of a conductor, right? Or if you don't understand that, it's just it's very possible for a function to cancel itself out. We've seen that all the time. So that it's possible. I don't know. Is that what this comes out to be? Yeah. Okay. Aw, oh, too bad. Is there a way you could tell? Nah, not totally. Sort of. Z's in every single one of them, but that doesn't really help you out too much. All right, so it's possible it comes out to be zero. I sure hell don't know, remember what the answer was to this. But don't feel like, I don't know if you ever feel like you get zero, like all that work for this? I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> awesome, all that work just condensed to zero. That's pretty good. Zero means something. I always want to go, zero means nothing, child. It literally means nothing. Okay, anything else from the homework stuff? Okay, okay. Let's get back to where we were last time. Let me go ahead. I'm going to give you this. This is getting a little ahead of where we are, but this is uh, another attempt of mine to show you what you should be doing for yourself. So this should be useful. It's incomplete because I didn't want to do all of it for you. All right, so we, we talked about, uh, I don't know if I said this phrase, but we talked about scalar line intervals. Why do we call that a scalar line interval? Why is that a scalar line interval? What's the function that we're actually evaluating in that interval? Hmm? Yeah, f is just a scalar function. It's got a scalar output. So that's why we call it a scalar line interval. Um, the thing we just started barely to get into, I think last time was the line intervals of the vector field. So um, I really want this to make sense. Um, when I integrate across a line, it's, it's nice to think of the physical idea of it, the, the surface over it, and the curtain idea we talked about last time. The fact that you do get an area. So it's just like a 180, somebody took a 180 problem and went and curved it. <laughs> That's really all it is. Instead of being a straight thing, we just took the x-axis and went, no, let me curve it this way, this way, this way, this way. Same problem. Same exact problem, to be honest. Um, but instead of it being a physical idea, math doesn't care that I think of this as a height. It just says it associates a value at that point. And a value, in that case, happens to be the height. But it could be any value. It could be uh, temperature at the point. It could be, that wouldn't really be a, a height. You know, so um, vector line intervals would be taking a path through a vector field, and we talked about this last time, that the, 
I only have to consider the parts that are actually running along the same direction that I'm running. So that's why I had a dot product makes sense. I'm going to dot the F with the path I take. The, the vector field with the path that I take. Um, and then that kind of brought in all the stuff that we've done before. Uh, let's see. Well, where did we leave off? I think we got as far as this idea. Are you good? Uh, the one here. We did a problem with this. I think we did a problem with this here, right? And the, 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 the very next step that I was that, that we would take is if the vector field was this, uh, yeah. where P, Q, and R are functions of X, Y, and Z, then when I do that dot product between this and the path that I'm taking, and, and again, uh, R prime, what's R prime look like? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, R of T would be uh, X of T, Y of T, Z of T. So R prime would be X prime, Y prime, Z prime, right? You guys with me? So we did that in a specific problem last time, but there's a better format to write it in if I do have all the components of that, uh, that R function. Uh, so I have this, uh, all the components of the vector field. Um, if I dot it with this, uh, let me go ahead and write this all out. Um, So if I throw those in and I dot those, then I am just going to get P D X D T Q D Y D T R D Z D T with a DT at the end. So that's why I think that's, that's just the dot product working its magic, right? So then I do end up with the integral of P D X Q D Y R D Z there at the end. Little DTs cancel like they like you with nice functions. Okay, so I think that's the last little piece I didn't say from there, because I do remember kind of giving at least a peek to the next line, the fundamental theorem for line integrals. I gave a little peek towards that, maybe, maybe not. Um, let's see, Let, let's do a problem like this with my suck-ass markers that I have. Um, let's see, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Let's try 21. They got that in red. I don't know what that means. So 21 gives us the vector field is sine x cosine. Sixteen two, yeah. They give us this. They give us R of T. Now this one, um, let's see. Well, we can do another one here. So let's see if the other one's good. All right. 
So, so what can I do? Can I, can, can I use this? How would I use this? What would, uh, what would P be? What's P? Sine x. Q. Cosine y. R. X z. I like it. And then what is this setup for x, y, and z here? So here x is t cubed, y is x t squared, z is t. So then I, I could do it the way we did this last time. In fact, it's kind of set up better for that anyway. Uh, I could do r prime and then do the dot product, right? But would I, what would I do with these? Well, okay, okay. But I would also plug them in, right? I like it. So what is dx? dx squared, dy, and dt, right? dy is 2, negative 2, t, dt. And z is good old dt. And what is, so now I got integral p dx q dy r dz. So p, how am I going to write it when I throw it in here? You can see the mathematics are, are, it's almost the same because this came from the way we did this before. What did I have to do with this and this? We have to actually plug it in. We have to do F at R of T, right? F at R of T. So this would be, P was, is going to be sine T cubed. And notice, of course, what, T, uh, what DX is. Yeah, which, why are we thankful for that? Otherwise, we're shit out of luck, right? Yeah, it's just the use of. And do you see how that would happen possibly a lot? Because that is the derivative of the what you're going to plug in. Do you see what's happening there? That is what I'm going to plug in. That is its derivative that I'm going to multiply by. So very often, this is going to come down to a use of, just the way it's constructed. So the work that this represents isn't different. It's exactly the same. It's just kind of a way to reorganize what we were doing the other day. And then you keep going. I wouldn't put DT three times. You'd put it at the end. Uh, Q would be cosine yeah, negative T squared times negative 2T DT. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And then plus, and then you just keep going. Fine. Same idea. So, this is what, so isn't that going to, wouldn't that happen every single time? Wouldn't that happen? Let, let's finish this out so I can show you the true shortcut that's going to happen. Every single time, whatever that, that's going to come, that's going to be what I plug in. So it's going to be inside some function, and then I'm going to also multiply it by dx. It's going to be its uh, chain rule piece that it needs. So what do we get? So then plus r, yeah, be xz. So it'll be t cubed times t, t to the fourth, and then I can find out by dt. Now, now, yes. And what's it going to go from to? Zero to one. I mean, and, and the rest of this is pretty simple, right? I guess. Yes. So that's sine multiplied by t cubed. No, no, no. This is sine of t cubed. Okay. This is sine of t cubed. Uh, sine by itself doesn't mean anything, of course. So then, how is that not cos negative cosine t squared? Well, I mean, you could use an identity. What is uh, sine of negative theta. And what's cosine and negative theta? Cosine of 
the cosine of theta. So you could take the negative away just because of what cosine does, of course. Oh. But you almost don't want to because it matches up perfectly with this. So the way, like, without doing it the shorthand, the way it should have been right now, should have been negative cosine squared, negative t squared. So q is cosine of y, right? Mm -hmm. And y is negative t squared. Okay. So q I could rewrite as cosine of negative t squared. Cool, okay. cool. So that's the right, that's right there. Right. Times dy, which was negative 2t dt. I guess, okay, because I'm trying to track it with, uh, so this sign. Well, this is help out. T, there we go. Does that help out? Okay. A lot more. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And the reason you don't need those parentheses there is if I meant sine cubed, I would put sine cubed. The cube would be like on the sine. But if, they, if yeah, visually it helps out, go for it. Okay, um, let me see if they give us this coming up. Oh, okay. So that's the last little piece of the section 16.2. Um, one big thing that's on that handout I just gave you, something that gets people down a lot, uh, or it should, if you're doing this correctly. You should definitely be reading through the theorems, making sure you understand what's going on. You need to know what it takes to have the theorem work. Because some, we're going to learn some stuff that it's sort of like, wow, that makes that easy. But it has to be in these very precise situations. Right? Anything that seems too easy sometimes requires a lot to be true for it to work. So I have a whole little definition section right in the middle because those words show up in a lot of the theorems that lead to this nice, quick way to do some things. Uh, the idea of open. So let's talk about these definitions real quick before we get to these theorems. Open is a region that does not contain its boundary points. So you can imagine drawing some region, maybe it's circular, maybe it's just some blob. But instead of doing this, you actually do a dotted line around it. Right, that's exactly, that's like open circles in the end of an interval. So what's the 2D analog of that? Is a dotted line around the region. So it does not contain its boundary points. That's what open means. So what's closed mean? Oh my God. Uh, so the reason it does contain its boundary points is crazy. Um, connected. If I have a connected region, that means that any point in that region, any two, oh, did I say any point? Any two points, that's a good job. Any points in the region can be joined by a path that lies in D. So to be connected, if I drew this, first off, that is open and closed. It's closed. Uh, even if I put, a, if I put a, a hole in it, you guys with me? So my region is actually this, this region, that's not included. Uh, from this point to this point, could I connect it with a path that lies entirely in the region? Yes. So what if my region is instead this, this is my region, this, this sandwich, these two pieces of bread. Can I connect any two points in the region by a path that lies in the region? No, so this would not be connected. Do you see why that word? makes complete sense. I love it. I like it. But when you read through the theorems, sometimes you don't also read through the sections that actually have the definitions. So you just sort of skip over, open simply, what the shit? Okay, let me just... Um, a simple curve is a curve that does not cross over itself. I think you guys would agree uh, when you're dealing with parametric or something, it's better if it, you know, sometimes it's better if it doesn't curve and cross itself. That could be very gross for some, so we call it a simple curve if it never intersects itself. Right? It's a street that doesn't run into itself. Um, and then simply connected. Simply connected just means, not just Jeff, but if I take, this is not, this is uh, connected, but it's not simply connected. Simply connected would mean any, uh, uh, any closed, uh, region that I can draw in D has to contain points that are in D. So like this is a closed region in D, right? And it contains points in D, doesn't it? But you can easily imagine there. Does that contain nothing but points in D? 
No, because we didn't include that, right? So basically, that's why I wrote down, hopefully I wrote that down, no holes, right? To be a simply connected region, there can't be any holes, because then you can draw a little circle around it, and it won't in include, it'll include points that aren't in D. Let me stop there for you. Right. So this is like 2D analogs to what's required for functions to work in Math 180, that's for continuous and all that kind of stuff. Remember all the theorems had, and some of them have differentiable, and that's gonna pop up every now and again, and some of these theorems you're gonna read there. In this case, it's gonna say, the first partial derivatives have to exist. Sometimes it'll say the second partials have to exist, depending on what theorem we're looking at. Okay, I like it. So for those I didn't put down there, because you, you should know what those mean. Um, so here's an example. Oh, and actually, let's start. Did I put that down? Yeah, cool. Let me remind you guys of what we did last time with this. This is really, really nice. I know what the integral of a derivative should do, right? The integral of a derivative, they should, yeah, you should just recover the function back. Um, that's pretty much what it says. If I take the integral of the gradient of a function, the gradient is really just the derivative in all three directions, and, or two directions, depending on what, uh, how many dimensions you're in. And that just depends on the function evaluated at each endpoint. Okay. So it was a really good day to have this printed out. Because uh, you can't really see my marker too well. All right, I really, let's, let's try this out. Let's do an example. Let me see. Is this still 16.2? This is now 16.3. 16.3 is the fundamental theorem for line integrals. It's the equivalent to f talk, what he used to call f talk 1, f talk 2. Fundamental theorem of calculus, f talk. Um, let me see, where's a good one? Oh, you know, real quick, let's fill this in. One more piece to this, and then we can do it a problem. Um, So, so something here, let me, let me, if I have an integral in general to do, and this is what's going to come up pretty soon, this will be really nice to know. We're going to develop ways to tell when this is true. If I know that this came from this, then if I could find this, I could do its integral really easily, right? And that process of finding this, we've kind of gone over it before. It's going to take a little bit extra to get through. And if you've done difficues, it's going to be very familiar. Um, oh. If, if you paid attention, if you did difficue and pay attention. Yeah, so let's, let's I, I think we talked about one already. One way we could tell. Remember correctly. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we did talk about it. So who remembers what we call it if there does exist what we call a potential function, the gradient of which would be the function we're talking about? Who remembers what we call it if that's true? There's a potential function. So what kind of function would that be? So, for example, gravity's got a potential function. Uh, it's say what kind of it's a, it wouldn't vote for Bernie Sanders. Conservative. Conservative. Oh. <laughs> Conservative vector field if there exists an F such that gradient of F equals the vector field. That's conservative vector field. So if there's a way, if they tell us of, uh, it's conservative, then there should be a way to find the little f. And if I can find little f, then the integral is going to be really easy. I like it. So if there was just a way to tell it was conservative, then I, I would know when to do that. Um, so let's do this. Are we getting there eventually? Yes, we are. So there's uh, a few more theorems, and we'll get to our first little piece of a test 
to tell if a vector field is conservative or not. And, and, um, and the word conservative, right now, I, have, I applied it to things like gravity. I talked about we have conservation of energy, conservation of mass, and they are related. But the idea of what this means will make a lot more sense once we develop the test for it. So let's just do a few more theorems. I think I have this on there somewhere. Um, the idea of independence of path. That's on there. Cool. So, how's this? I want, so, so if I have a vector field set up, so some vector field, I've got it drawn out, and I'm going to take a path through this, some closed path through this. All right, so it would be conservative. Yeah, it would be conservative if, and think about what this means. Uh, so something that's not conservative would be running current through a wire, because what's going to happen? What are you going to lose energy to? You're going to lose energy to ohmic heat. You're going to lose energy to heat generation, right? So it's losing something. So if I take a closed path through a field, and the integral across that path, along that path, comes out to be zero, right? That means that I didn't pick up anything or lose anything. So it's conservative in that sense. So conservative vector field. To be independence of path, to, to have independence of path, that means the integral across any closed curve in the vector field has to be zero. Now that's not useful, to be honest, as a check to see if something is independent of path, because then I have to use every single possible path between two, uh, you know, every single path. If I want to start at A and come back to A, how many ways is there to do that? A lot, yeah, infinite number. So I, I, it's not a good check to see if something is independent of path. So I want to connect these ideas of conservative independent of path and then come up with a way to tell if it is conservative. And then I'll know this is true. Um, so let me see. Do, do, do. So I think it's the next one right after this. So right now on this paper, I'm right up here, the very top. Uh, is independent of path if and only if that integral is zero for every closed path? Indeed. So if I knew it was independent of path, then I would know that the integral along any closed path would be zero. But as a test to see if it's independent of path, it sucks. So what's the next theorem? Let's hope that this is part A on uh, independence of path. So part B says, oh, sorry, that's the very first thing. The definition of independent path. Part A says, if D is an open connected region, so those two we talked about earlier, they're up on your definitions. If D is an open connected region on which the vector field, of course, is continuous, that's something that we know from Math 180, it's gotta be true for this stuff to make sense. Um, and we know that the integral is independent of path, so that still kind of sucks. Then there exists Now where this comes where this becomes finally useful is when we say it's also true uh, the other way around. So that would be let me see where I put it. There it is. to do is going to seem very familiar to some stuff we've done before. We're going to do, we're going to take a second and try to do a problem 
where we're going to find this little left dude, we're still leading to the point where uh, I can check. So if I'm able to check a vector field to see if it's conservative, to see if it's, which we'll find out eventually means it's independent of path, then I could use that shortcut, that uh, fundamental theorem for line integrals. I'm allowed to use that in that case. Um, yeah, cool. I like it. So let's do this. Let's do an example. Let me see if we got a little example. Yeah, cool. Perfect. Let's do an example of finding this little dude here. Again. So this is related to the work. So if I know that it's if I know that it's conservative, that means I can find this function. And why is that nice? Because if I can write this like this, this integral is stupid. I don't even have to really integrate. I really just have to find this function. I don't even have to write this. If I can find little f such that the gradient of f is big F. That means that I can just evaluate it at the endpoints and be done. So that's why it's, I don't want to always try to find the gradient because sometimes it doesn't exist and then I have to have another way to do the interval. But if I have a way to tell ahead of time if little f exists, that's awesome. So let's take a second and, and I just want to show you the work is very familiar to stuff we've done before. Um, so if little if, if f does equal del f, del little f, right? What does that mean? And that means the first part of f has to be what what well, what's del f? And we're working in two dimensions here. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I like. It. I was waiting for saying say del f, but okay. Uh, partial f. I like it. So that means then that this has to be fx. We've kind of done this work before, and of course this has to be fy. Now this part of this, some of you guys, if you've taken the different q before, you're ahead of the game, you know what to check. And you even have a name you call this type of. Exactly. Like, there you go. Um, so how do I undo this? I want to figure out what little f is. So how do I do this part? This is sort of like half of a double interval. Yeah, so then you get, what do you get for F so far? You get 3X three, 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 plus C. That's good if you only have one variable, then you only need a, 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 a constant, a true constant. Yeah, you, <coughs> bless you. Related to FX, what's a constant? Any function of Y. So I'm just going to put... G of Y. I like it. This, this process is really nice. It's very straightforward. It's related to some stuff we've done in here before. And again, if you've taken different cubes, you're really, really familiar with this. Um, I know what FY is supposed to be. And I've got an expression for F. Partial. Yeah, so then if I take the partial, I can compare it to what I know it's supposed to be. Get the idea of it, and you don't have to memorize the process. You, if you get the idea, you know exactly what to do. I want to take one of these. It doesn't matter which one I start with. I just started with that one because I wrote it first. And get an expression for f. If I had done this one instead, f would have been blah, blah, plus g of x. So same reasoning, right? But in the end, you're going to agree. It's going to agree. Uh, f, y. What did I get? That's x squared. Yeah, g prime of y, because that's just a function of y alone. 
So what's g prime of y have to be? Negative 3y squared. Yeah, negative 3y. So g prime of y, negative 3y squared. So g of y is negative y cubed. So then we get f. Let me stop right there. You guys with me? Because in that point, when I do this integral, what calculus class am I in? Math 1A, right? This is a function of y only. So when I integrate it, I'm going to get a true constant. Yes, sir? Where did you take the t from? Oh, right here. What does this say? This is what f of y looks like from what I know about the form of f. And I don't really know them. I know this for sure. And then this part is like it could be any damn thing, any function of y. I, I just don't freaking know. But I do have more information I haven't used yet. So that's what f looks like. I could do fy on this, then compare. x squared, x squared, plus I don't know, minus 3. Oh, I don't know must equal negative 3y squared. Just compare it, just compare it. Right, x squared, x squared, plus stuff I don't know, minus 3. Oh, stuff I don't know must be negative 3y squared. <coughs> and then you integrate. It's, then you're back in math 180 for a second. You integrate. So you get, finally, f equals 3x, 3x plus, x squared y plus x squared y. Minus y squared. Yeah, minus y cubed. Plus. Now, now this piece, considering that we're what we're normally doing is we're going to try to use the um, fundamental theorem, where you do this, the difference. That c is not important, but of course, if you just have an f function you're finding by itself, you're not going to integrate then you better put that plus C. Right? The whole plus C thing has come back now. Yes, sir? So is that that last step that we were at to like start getting ready to prove that tell that equals? Well, I mean, I know it's true. If this process works, then it's true. I, I, you, you can double check yourself by taking the, the grad of this, right? And making sure that it actually comes out. So what's Fx going to be? 3 plus 2xy. Yeah, I mean, you can always check yourself, but you forced it to be true. As long as you did all these steps, you know it's true. Yeah. You're done, but you can, I mean, there's nothing wrong with checking yourself. Why not? I like it. So then if my question, for example, if my question was, um, you know, the integral, it, it doesn't really even matter, but if, if my question was the integral from 2 to 7 or something, I can just use this to get the answer. I don't need the plus C then. I just do f evaluated at one side minus f evaluated at the other side. It's just like the, the normal fundamental theorem in that respect. I like it. I like it. Okay. So let's take a step back. We actually, let me see if you guys realize we can develop this kind of like on our own. If this is true, if these do come from some f dude, what was that Clairaut's theorem? Yeah, if you, have, if you start with f and you make fx and you make fy, where they have to kind of match back up again is when you check f, x, y versus... So let's take a second. This, this is what we assumed fx was. Well, what's f, x, y then? 